And hello, I'm Keith Hilden, and this is Squawkonomics. We are having an interview today with Mr. Bill Still. Uh, Bill Still has a long history of many accomplishments, uh, uh, not least of which is his uh, newest film, uh, Jekyll Island, that he produced and directed himself. He is also known for the uh, documentary, The Secret of Oz, as well as the, I think it is the most viewed documentary in history, if I'm correct, The Money Masters? No, it's, it's typically in, in the top 25 of all time. Okay, okay. Well, it's a very, very widely watched uh, documentary and very highly respected in the documentary uh, community. Uh, and to the left of you is Han Wen, and uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm a software engineer in Beijing, and uh, I'm interested with the Bitcoin system, but not. Yeah. Right. Um, the first question I'd like to ask you, uh, I think that is an intersection point that brings us together here from our, our different backgrounds, uh, Bitcoin. And Bitcoin was praised by early adopters for its financial privacy and liberty qualities. It was praised by its early supporters as a private store of value. But now Bitcoin audits are getting better. Bitcoin forensics are getting better. There really isn't that quality of privacy anymore to it. And from the economic crime investigation standpoint, it's a godsend because the wallet addresses are all right there and nobody needs a subpoena or a court order uh, to go look into the blockchain. Uh, any investigator, anyone, period. So really, bitcoins are more transparent than bank accounts and because not everybody with the bank account number can go walk into the bank and see how much is there. So we're all the emperors here. We're the diviners of our own destinies here but we've got no clothes. And financial privacy now with the gatekeepers at the payment gateways, know your customer, anti-money laundering, and most recently, biometric scanner ATMs, hardly the things of financial privacy. So I wanna ask you, Bill, where do things go for, for, for from here? Are we looking at decreased liberty and privacy because of Bitcoin? And if not, how does Bitcoin remain a bastion for liberty and freedom rather than being a Trojan horse of uh, panopticon financial surveillance? Oh, gosh. Can you ask a longer question than that? <laughs> uh, well, um, oh, where do I start here? The, this whole cryptocurrency business um, is it, just experimental money. It's uh, people who have finally been able to get around uh, the, uh, the debt money system uh, and, and create, uh, create experiments in new monetary systems. And so uh, they might not all go as well as, uh, as we might think. Bitcoin, I think, has uh, some, some basic flaws that you haven't mentioned, namely the uh, depreciating quantity uh, problem will uh, render it uh, uh, relatively, certainly useless as, a, as money after quite a while. It, it, Bitcoin will be around for quite a while, but mm -hmm. Its design makes it so, so that it self-extinguishes, and you, you run into the problem of, of the guy trying to sell the last Bitcoin. Okay. I find um, it really interesting what you just said um, as far as you think the deflationary qualities is a bad thing. I mean, can you explain that to me? Because I would think that in a hyperinflationary world where you know we have all these countries that are printing money, not just the U.S., I thought with a Bitcoin having a deflationary force with it, that people would lose their Bitcoins and forget about them, would be right. a, a deflationary force that would balance out the inflationary uh, situation that we have in the U.S. I mean, well, yeah, would but, I be but it, it, be, it becomes uh, deflationary enough so, so that Bitcoins can't replace themselves. And so it eventually, theoretically, at least they dwindle down to zero. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that's not a good thing. I, I, ideally, you want to, for something to serve as money, you want to have the quantity to remain constant. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that's what some of the other experiments, that's one of the reasons that I signed on to the whole quark uh, concept is, is because that was an improvement. Over, they, they saw that flaw in Bitcoin and tried to correct it. Mm -hmm. But there are going to be many experiments down through the years here. What's, what's just wonderful is, is that we can actually ha now have effective complementary currencies. And what I mean by effective is complementary currencies have always suffered uh, from the, the inability to create efficient trade systems. Mm -hmm. Yes, they've been, uh, in the United States, they've been legal at least since um, 
uh, the Great Depression of the 1930s when over 3,000 complementary currencies uh, cropped up in the United States, and the, the U.S. government at that point uh, decided to take a stance that, that, yes, as long as they did not mimic the look of, uh, of the legal tender, the U.S. dollar, then they, it was perfectly all right for, for people to uh, create their own complementary currencies because uh, there was really no alternative. The people didn't have enough money. The, the newly formed Federal Reserve had a, a, an iron grip on the quantity because they, they had been, been able to uh, return America to a gold-only money system, and a scarce money just doesn't work to serve the middle and the lower classes. It works great hmm. uh, to, to serve the upper classes, and always has. Uh, but but uh, it's, it's the difference between uh, uh, cheap money and, and expensive money down throughout history. Cheap money always tends to serve the middle class, mm -hmm. whereas expensive money does not. And so uh, uh, that's, uh, that's the problem. Uh, it's complementary currencies, however, have always been limited by, by tremendous inefficiencies. Uh, we, we have many examples in today's world. Uh, for example, mountain hours in Colorado, <laughs> um, that gentleman, uh, the gentleman behind that, na named of Wayne Walton, I believe, has has uh, spent tens of thousands of his dollars trying to get different complementary currencies going here in the United States in three or four different locations. Really? And uh, he has literally thrown uh, his his uh, bank account and his life's energy into trying to get these going. And he uh, Mountain Hours, for example, the last time. I was there, I think it had been going for about 18 months, and uh, he had managed to garner exactly 42 participants. I'm really? sure he's doing better now, but, but uh, uh, still, this is very ineffect ineffective, inefficient. But adding the dimension of being tradable uh, securely over the Internet without any fear of the double spending problem uh, it is just uh, a revolution in, in how money uh, can be created. And mm -hmm. uh, there, thereby, we, we now have opened the floodgates for monetary experimentation, and that's what's going on. It's, it's the wild west of monetary experiment, experimentation, and I, I trumpet it as a, a great advance. Certainly. Um, I, that was a really, really interesting response. Um, and I think Howen has a question for you um, as far as how the uh, average people wrap their heads around this because I think this is the domain for people of monetary theory and the question is, is how can we bring this idea to be popularized by the people and I think that's what Howen wanted to ask. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, hi, Bill. Hi. Uh, as we know that Bitcoin has got a very complex technical system so do you think that will the people trust it without understanding how it works? Uh, yes, because, uh, th well, for example, the people uh, have no idea how money works right now. Uh, even our own, uh, our own uh, legislators here in the United yeah. States, U.S. congressmen, even, even heads of financial committees will, will typically uh, say things that, that let you know that they don't understand that all, virtually all money is created uh, out of nothing as an interest-bearing debt, not by the government, not by the Federal Reserve System, but by the commercial bank. And when they first hear this, they, uh, most people just don't believe it because they, they have been led to believe that the Federal Reserve is part of the U.S. government. And so thereby the government is doing things to not only create the money but to protect us and, and make money serve the public interest. That's not the case at all. The Federal Reserve is a private corporation. It's admitted it, it, it themselves. Uh, U.S. federal courts have re ruled repeatedly that it's a private corporation. And a, a private corporation can only, by definition, serve its stockholders. Uh, the, all of the Fed stockholders are the commercial banks of the United States. Therefore, 
Uh, the Federal Reserve System can never serve the public interest. It must serve the corporate interest. It must serve the banking interests. Mm -hmm. And that's what's killing the economy of the United States. That's why the U.S. economy is literally in a death spiral from which it can never escape profitably for the middle class under the current conditions. That's why you see things like uh, Bitcoin, this rampant experimentation going on. Although people may not understand exactly what's wrong, they know something is wrong. And so uh, yeah. as, as throughout history, uh, they try to circumvent, they try to find a workaround around this system. And that's, that's what's going on today. So I, I interface with a lot of average people who don't know anything about economics, mm -hmm. and they're asking me every single day, gee, how do I buy some Bitcoin? These are people who can barely use a computer. Really? Yeah. Oh, that would... Do you pretty, get I that see. feeling um, in Beijing, Hawan? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty impressive. Local yeah. people that don't know how to use too much of a computer, you know, they know how to use, a, you know, the cell phone and, you know, Wan Shouji, and, you know, that's really about I, it, right? Beijing, but they have interest in Bitcoin, too? Beijing, the normal people just um, don't really get into it, just like we're, we're here online. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm a technology guy, so my my circles, my, my guys, we all knowing uh, how it is and what it is, how mm -hmm. it works, so people trust it. Mm -hmm. But normal people, they, they uh, in China at least, they, 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 uh, they, they have a little bit of freedom. Mm -hmm. Since, since we have you here, I wanted to ask you, you know, December 5th, you know, the People's Bank of China came out and said that uh, prices could not be set in Bitcoin in China, uh, said that uh, later made a move uh, late in December that uh, renminbi cannot be moved into uh, Bitcoin. Um, how is that, you know, on the ground really affecting People. I mean, is it on one hand, it's, you know, you can't uh, price it in Bitcoin, but I mean, isn't there workarounds and aren't people doing things just the same, but just doing it in a different way, you know? Yeah, you know what? Um, for just trying to find the way to do it, even though the, you know, the easiest way may not be the way, but there are still ways to do it. And are people still pursuing those ways? attention about Bitcoin, so th those news don't just um, affect them, but uh, the people who make in investments with Bitcoins, they, they are very crashed about the news, mm -hmm. because, uh, because the news is from the government and the central bank, so um, the Bitcoin drops a lot in the Chinese market. Mm -hmm. the value. Yeah, the arbitrage actually moved towards the bitcoins are uh, less valuable in China, whereas before the regulatory move, you know, it was the opposite, and you were making arb moves and making money by selling bitcoins to China. Now it's the obvious other way around here. Um, anyway, uh, I think I think what uh, what Keith was trying to ask is a question of mine also. Even though the government publicly came out uh, basically a little bit negative on on bitcoin. Uh, practically speaking, uh, there was a phone company that was uh, making an offer uh, in Bitcoin, it's, and plus uh, it seemed like there was op open defiance in the streets of Beijing, especially among restaurants, uh, which were still accepting payment in Bitcoin. Uh, so what he was asking was, are people doing it anyway? Someone will do it. I, I didn't. I didn't hear hear the news for what you're saying. A, a phone company. Do you get the name? Uh, yes. They they made a, an offer. Uh, they made an offer in uh, that that you could you could pre-order a certain new uh, a phone. I'd have to go back. I did a I did a still report on it at the time it was news, perhaps 30 days ago. And this was just, just before the, the news about the, the central bank. And in fact, the head of the central bank uh, <coughs> uh, made ki kind of a different statement than the official government statement. His statement was less harsh. So 
uh, we were just assuming that maybe trade in Bitcoin had gone a little bit towards the black market side. No, just not just a little bit. All of them have gone to the black market in China because um, the central bank and, and government, the government says nobody will accept Bitcoin after this, after this news has been released. It will be illegal. So nobody is doing it in public today in China. I see. So even not restaurants? Yeah, yeah. Even not restaurants. Oh, okay. Well, well because we're, we're, we're about to open, open a direct access uh, uh, to the U.S. dollar for both Bitcoin and Quark coin. And uh, so... Uh, we're going to get direct access to the to the American banking system. That's that's coming very soon. Oh. So you won't you won't have to you won't have to go through uh, Mount Gox anymore or those type of deals. But honestly, um, in, in China, people um, just don't don't um, care about the, the laws about the internet, even about Bitcoin. You know, people downloading music, downloading illegal copies of software online every day. People just don't care about the laws. So even about Bitcoin, people just still doing it. Even in black market, black market but, but the people just don't think they are illegal. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. So I don't think it's a big thing for Bitcoin in China. I mean, the, the, the big news from the central bank and the government. I think it's just uh, an, an, an article respect, response for this. So you think it's, it's what? It's just an article response for Bitcoin, I think, from China, huh? from China uh -huh. government and its government. So it's, 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 not, it's not for what we do or anything changed or something like that. Well, my guess when the news came out was that this was just the Chinese government saying yes, something the for for the world banking system, yes. uh, trying to reassure them that we're still going to be part of your system. Uh, we're not going to let Bitcoin uh, get uh, too popular. But in reality, I think their statement could have been much stronger against Bitcoin. I think uh, especially with the comments of the head of the central bank after the government's announcement uh, coming out and giving a much softer interpretation of the government rule, I, I think that just undercut totally uh, the, the government making uh, trade in Bitcoin illegal. I don't think that's what their intention is at all. Yeah, yeah, I don't think so either. And um, in the real world, the statement is, is much, much more weaker. It's much, much right. Like people don't right. care. So the people are just doing what, what they do every day it's about the Bitcoin. It's, it's kind of, you know, there's no smoking in the elevators, right, Hawen? And what yeah. happens? <laughs> people say, I'm going to smoke two cigarettes now instead, right? Okay, okay, okay. Don't, don't bring up this. <laughs> okay. a lot of news about hikers around the world so I want to ask you um, how do you think Bitcoin would solve this problem this kind of issue scarcity issue scarcity issue yes well that's that's exactly what all these if you notice the new coins that are coming out uh, very few of them are going for small quantities most of the new coins are going for massive quantities, whereas Bitcoin, I think, is limited at 26 million coins. Uh, now all the new coins are in the billions or even trillions. So uh, it, it's going the other way. You're getting uh, coins with, with uh, much larger quantities of distribution. And uh, it, there, uh, as far as how fast the distribution occurs and all that, these are all experiments. Everybody's trying it a different way. It's, just very interesting to me. Uh, it's uh, a revolution in, in uh, monetary science. Um, so, uh, what I mean is, uh, is 
figure a way for Bitcoin itself to have a some uh, to improve his system or in uh, in other respect like uh, uh, te technicians respect to uh, to solve this problem so people just don't worry about it because you know I uh, I have a co-worker in the company and he has a lot of bitcoins and every time I scare him like oh I can I can steal some uh, some software I made it to steal one of the bitcoins it's kind of well I, I think uh, I think it still holds true that that uh, no Bitcoin wallet has ever been cracked and had Bitcoin stolen. There's no re report of that. Uh, if, uh, I think there have been some reports of Bitcoins being stolen, but it's not at the wallet level. It's at some sort of the exchange level. And so I, I think uh, there's still nothing for people to fear as far as stealing the, the Bitcoins out of your wallet goes. As far as changing the structure of Bitcoin to try to fix some of these problems. I'm not technically advanced enough to be able to speak to that with authority. However, I have asked that question myself. And those people who are very technical say it would be difficult. And really the only way to do it is, is to fork the blockchain, if you know what that means. Wow. You, you have you have to basically change, you have to, uh, I, I think my understanding is you have to have a majority of the Bitcoins and they all decide to go a, a different line along the blockchain and then you can change it. This would be almost impossible. Uh, it, and plus, I mean, there, there are what, there, there must be over a hundred different coins right now. And uh, just from, since I'm kind of, I've been thrust into the center of this this cryptocurrency vortex now. I, I get advance notice of all these things coming out. There, there are <laughs> dozens more coins coming, and all with different structures. It's just a, a wonderful uh, field of, a, of monetary experimentation right so, now. To so where you think my even, even the banks, I mean, JP Morgan uh, tried to, uh, to, to get a patent for its own coin through the U.S. Patent Office, and in December, they were turned, they had all 175 of their claims turned down. Now, there's another report out that suddenly uh, the patent office has reversed themselves. I have not chased that down yet, uh, but I, I doubt that that's true because uh, Jamie Dimon, the head of J.P. Morgan at the Davos uh, meeting just this week, uh, denounced Bitcoin and, in fact, gave a veiled threat uh, that anyone who helped implement Bitcoin, J.P. Morgan would not deal with. Now, he's talking directly to the other banks. And I, I know for a fact that there are people talking to the big banks right now uh, trying to get a direct, uh, what they call a USD cross to Bitcoin. In really? other words, so you wouldn't have to go through Mt. Gox. It'd just be like a regular thing. You call up or you go online with your credit card, boom, you buy Bitcoin like that. That's going to happen. It's going to happen this year, and that's going to revolutionize the, uh, the whole cryptocurrency market. And right now, talk about early days. Uh, what, what do you think the percentage? I don't know this number. I wish I, and, uh, I wish I knew someone who did, but the percentage of the population that currently uses uh, cryptocurrency in any way, shape, or form uh, uh, probably is less than one-tenth of one percent. Uh, once, once you get a direct U.S. dollar cross uh, to Bitcoin or any of the other uh, cryptos, it's going to explode. No doubt. No doubt. It's fascinating okay. stuff, and that makes my prediction of 200 to 300 cryptocurrencies in 2014 that much more real. <laughs> that was an excellent question. Um, As I did we not say in France, c'est possible. Uh, <laughs> I didn't. I didn't want to interrupt you guys because you guys seem like you have something, you know, good, good going there. Um, because uh, we, we were talking about um, some um, security issues about uh, Bitcoin. I, I know. I was like half listening in the background. It was fascinating. Um, this guy. Let me ask you. I interviewed um, last week about uh, Fatka and Bitcoins, and he. Uh, we uh, had a very interesting conversation about. He believes 
that cryptocurrencies are going to start showing up on financial companies' uh, financial statements. Uh, not financial companies, uh, regular companies' financial statements. And it's very interesting because he admitted that at the same time, the Taiwanese authorities have no clue whatsoever how to audit uh, Bitcoins coming into Taiwan. So they're trying to stave them off from getting into Taiwan, but at the same time, they recognize that this is a force that they can't control. And there's already Taiwanese companies who have cryptocurrencies on their financial statements. Oh, there's a, already a major company in a, 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 a Central American nation, let's put it that way, I won't, I won't uh, specify, uh, that's, that's making a big business from doing just that, from showing uh, companies how to buy into the Bitcoin market and uh, uh, how to avoid taxation issues. Uh, this is already a multi-million dollar business and uh, it's go just going to continue. Definitely. It can't be stopped. Uh, the, the whole, uh, the, now that hu humanity ha has learned how to make their own workaround currencies, this is, this is a giant force that's been suppressed uh, for a, at least a century. It cannot be stopped. There's just way too much pressure. And you're talking about the 100 years of uh, Federal Reserve control over the U.S., and you think that Bitcoin is one of the linchpins that is finally going to relinquish that control. That's right, even though it's, it's, it's probably very imperfect, even though it probably uh, uh, will, will not be uh, the major trading, mm -hmm. uh, crypto trading vehicle in the future, it is definitely uh, the revolutionary event uh, so far of uh, this century. Now, I came at the end when you were talking about J.P. Morgan and how he had nothing but bad words to talk about Bitcoin, and it was completely different from what Richard Branson uh, said as far as Bitcoin that I got from your uh, still report, by the way. So um, we see a major discrepancy with that. Now, I have seen on the street of Taiwan a strange thing. I've seen local stores advertising that they accept Hawen. Electronic uh, currencies. And okay. they're accepting them on the street uh, between street. stores. And what's happening, Bill, is that stores are partnering with each other to accept, uh, for instance, this thing called MoneyCoin. And MoneyCoin is interesting in the sense that it's uh, getting diverting off the track of the incentives of the first generation digital currencies which uh, use mining as an incentive. And what Hanwen was talking about, um, purists are going to care about mining and rewards that they can get with mining. The mass majority of people on the street are just going to want to use these uh, digital currencies and cryptocurrencies just to buy things and sell things and things like that. And I think there's going to be much more um, value in it as a payment system um, as far as that's concerned. So Taipei has latched on this as far as using this as a payment system. And uh, like I said, I, I, I just find it really, really interesting because I think that there's going to be more stores that are come up, come up with their own uh, digital currencies. Um, Taiwan has kind of a Keiretsu system with their business where um, groups of business link together um, in a chain. And I can see it quite possible that one of the Keiretsu uh, groups in Taiwan that uh, take uh, the uh, uh, cryptocurrency idea and uh, form their own cryptocurrency which is exchanged within an interlocking uh, network of stores. Um, so I see that as um, completely possible in Taiwan. But they are doing it in a way that it's straying from the original concept of Bitcoin. Um, they're taking the digital part of the currency, they're taking the crypto part of the currency, the QR functionality, but they're probably doing away with the decentralization of the currency and they're doing away with the uh, mining incentive of the uh, currency. So are we seeing a, um, you know, a, a, a world where we are going to have the original ideals of Bitcoin um, basically be uh, second notion um, in exchange for something like 
JP Morgan's coin or in Taiwan, money coin, uh, which is gathering quite a bit of ground in Taiwan. Um, these corporate currencies that run on corporate rails, are, are they going to be enough to derail the, uh, the uh, independent decentralized cryptocurrency movement? No one knows. Uh, I, I, I know for a fact that one of the new uh, cryptos coming out uh, is uh, s said to have uh, uh, s massive support uh, from Goldman Sachs, for example. Uh, there ha have been uh, a ru many rumors as far as Clark. Uh, there, there's now a, a 30 uh, million uh, uh, Clark wallet. Uh, that people suspect was uh, was amassed a by uh, banking interests, and I could name the bank, but I'm not going to name the bank uh, specifically for the, the purpose of trying to control and or destroy it. And at this point, uh, they finally figured out, I think, that because of uh, Clark's uh, quick distribution, quick and wide distribution, mm -hmm. uh, that they're unable to control it, and so they're uh, they're they're dumping this project, and uh, that wallet is is now starting to shrink rapidly. And once that the and this is this is all theory, but uh, once that wallet has evaporated, it's now uh, down to uh, below 22 million. Mm -hmm. Once that wallet uh, evaporates, then uh, Quark is going to take off again uh, and, and reach a, another. At some point, uh, for any of these cryptos to uh, serve effectively as money, there has to be some stability in mm -hmm. them. And so it can't always be this giant speculative market. Uh, but it looks like Quark's price has been suppressed deliberately. And so it looks like uh, I, I, we've always theorized that the Quark would trade at par with the U.S. dollar. I was uh, very surprised to see with the news of not only BTC 38, but the news that the NSA scandals uh, rendered a lot of the cryptocurrencies as basically hackable because the, um, you know, the encryption algorithms are uh, obsolete now. And I would think that that kind of news would have propelled the Quark price much farther than it actually did. So I was wondering myself, uh, what was holding back Quark? And it's, the, it's this giant wallet, and uh, mm -hmm, it, it's mm -hmm. quickly being depleted now. So, uh, so the cat's now out of the bag. And I think we've had a very useful conversation here. And, uh, okay, good. <laughs> uh, the, there's been a lot of issues covered. I mean, this this whole thing about about the 30 million wallet uh, is, is not is not public information uh, so that's that's news our discussion about uh, how China is uh, how the Chinese population is reacting to the edicts of the Chinese government I think that is is uh, useful to the entire community there's a lot of issues that we've covered that I think will make this uh, a popular interview Great, great. Bring up what's money, money coin. I do have the picture of that. I will show that to you, Bill. So you'll be seeing that very soon. And I, I kind of see it as a corporate Let run. Let me interrupt you a minute. I wanted to say something about money coin. And that, that is that, that the pressure is so great to, to intervene in, the, in this uh, deadlocked debt money system that all they're doing, uh, the structure you're talking about with money coin is just a typical complementary uh, currency structure. Uh, it is. They're, they're, they're using adopting. the marketing of Bitcoin. They're using the QR and the electronic currency, and they even use the Chinese word, the term dens of what be. But they're maligning what is a cryptocurrency and what is a digital currency. Right. They're just taking they're taking off what they can quickly to enhance the complementary currency aspect. And uh, this th it's not going to hold. It might become popular for a while, but as people become more sophisticated, they're going to understand that yes, the encryption, the whole encryption process is very, very important. So uh, it, it's all it, you can make money just off of a watered down version of the Bitcoin concept, and that's what's happening, I think, with uh, money. Coins. You're right. You're right. And I, I, I think that's um, what it was kind of a, a curse rather than a blessing in the sense that Bitcoin went over a thousand dollars a piece because then. 
a lot of these companies who otherwise wouldn't take the time to exploit Bitcoin and to turn it, you know, on, and run it on corporate rails, as I wrote in my article on Zero Hedge. I don't know if you saw that, um, where I said that the future of uh, Bitcoin in Singapore is going to be run completely on corporate rails because Singapore isn't going to have it anymore. They're moving farther and farther into that. Um, and it goes with the um, HSBC uh, ad that I saw where they said, you know, in the future, data will be the most valuable currency. That's not the question that I wanted to ask you, but I wanted to mention that. Um, if Jeff was going to be here, I was going to ask you a question about TPP and intellectual property. Um, and I also well, wanted I'm, to... I'm glad you aren't going to ask me that because sh uh, we barely know anything of uh, the contents of the TPP here in the United States. Should I read it? Absolutely an outrage. Should I read it? Okay, um, I was at a conference at about the uh, Thai economy and the state of the Thai stock market last year. Uh, and I remember many prominent people that influenced the Thai economy that were utterly opposed to the TPP at that time. And very prominent people stood up and said, we are not having the TPP in Thailand. And the reason I learned uh, because of that meeting was because of they were concerned about the dramatic rise of the price of their pharmaceuticals. Now, as you said, Taiwan wants to sign this, and Ma Ying Zhou is on it. Um, I've seen, uh, you know, plenty of commentary in the local paper over here that uh, there's a lot of um, uh, talk against the TPP. Uh, and uh, how is TPP going to impact um, Taiwan, and how would it impact China? interested in uh, uh, tai Taiwan uh, only in uh, newspaper reports it seems uh, that there uh, is interest I think also well no that's not true because actually the president has expressed an interest and this would be a horrible mistake for Taiwan uh, I just hope they, they don't buy into it that's why I specifically mentioned them in my report on one of my reports on the TPP mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay okay very very good answer and the other question I wanted to ask you is that China has not updated its gold holdings since about 2009. Is that correct? So I'll say it again. Um, China has not updated its gold holdings in many years. Um, and in 2014, if China declares a higher amount of gold holdings uh, than expected, uh, how does that change China? What's the big picture? That's interesting. I, I didn't understand your question right at first. By updating their gold holdings, you mean updating the accounting of the gold holdings? Correct. Not actually, in, because the, the suspicion here uh, Monday on this side of the, the Pacific me. is that China is continuing to try to add to its gold holdings. That's why they constructed the new uh, gold vault underneath the Hong Kong airport, etc. Of course, uh, China might might be the recipients of, of a lot of these tungsten cord gold bars, and I, I imagine they're, they're doing something to prevent that. So the, the whole gold thing is just so shrouded in mystery and uh, fakery that uh, I, there's, I don't really have much to say about it other than that. Uh, China, uh, China would, would be wise, uh, I think China is wise, to stock up on other things, uh, other uh, things that hold value other than gold. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I can tell you from a personal experience that um, people, uh, when I was in China, people were, uh, and half of themselves wanted to buy gold and half of themselves was thinking if I should buy it. So there was always this like two-sided thinking to it. And I, I would imagine it would happen on the government level as well. And it has happened on very high levels where, um, you know, uh, very important shipments have, you know, been laced with tungsten. So yeah, I can, I can totally uh, see that. Well, this is this is a very interesting discussion, actually. <laughs> I'm glad you see it that way. Um, and you know, uh, amidst uh, preparation gone awry, the last question I wanted to to ask you was. Um, Okay, essentially here in Taiwan, uh, there is a over 200 million industrial robot R&D and manufacturing facility going up in Taiwan, and uh, it's from Honhai, uh, Foxconn, Pushikang, and they want to uh, basically take over the global production of uh, 
of industrial robots, and they want to be pioneers in that. Um, and the company will increasingly staff its own factories with robot workers. Um, now, I read something from Louis uh, Vincent Gave, uh, a resident Hong Konger economist, and he said that there are four category workers uh, between complex and non-complex, and repetitive and non-repetitive. And he thinks that in the OECD countries, the repetitive and basic jobs are already gone. It's already replaced by robotics and automation and things like that. Um, we still have uh, repetitive and basic jobs in China, for instance, right? And how does that play out? Um, are we looking at a future in the OECD or in the developing countries where the creative destruction of jobs outpaces new job creation? Uh, paces, did you say? Outpaces job creation. Outpaces, oh yeah, certainly. Uh, the, the entire economic structure of the world is going to change uh, with, just because of this job destruction issue. And that's why the Swiss, for example, uh, have have this initiative before them for uh, the the basic uh, what do they call it the the basic uh, the basic income the Swiss basic income. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I heard and, about that. Yeah. Uh, uh, nations are going to have to face this because people have to have some sort of an income to live. Uh, wh whether how, how once again this is going to be a big area of experimentation. How do you continue to? Uh, create a, an incentive-driven society if you can't provide people with useful work. Um, it's it's a very, that, is, that might be the, the most difficult question of right. the century. Right. In, in, in one direction, we're moving towards like a mega welfare system that's going to be have to tempered with some sense of you're going to have to put in some sort of productivity. Whether or not that creates income for you personally, it would create some societal benefit and then you you know you would be able to get some uh, draw from that um, and you know unproductive people I don't think you know indefinitely can just uh, continue to uh, sit back on the couch and uh, have their benefit checks come in I, and I think that that's possible now because that there's a relatively small amount of them um, if like you know we talked about if the uh, automation jobs that are going to supposedly materialize uh, alongside automation, then we're really looking at a situation where we have uh, a lot of increased unemployment, which means we have to mobilize a lot of um, purpose for these people, I think both young and old. And in the OECD, we're definitely moving farther down that track, whereas in China, we haven't really started to see that so much. I mean, right. even if you go on the bus, I mean, how when, you know, well, you have two or three people that take the ticket for you, right? I yeah, mean, that's, that's three well, yeah, jobs right there. there. It is. That's three jobs for one bus. So automation hasn't even begun to happen in China. It, yeah, the West, the West will have to face this first, and it is it is such a significant issue that we are so completely unprepared for, mm -hmm. and yet it's hurtling at us. We're going to see increasing unemployment. People are not going to know why it is. On top of that, you have the entire collapse of the debt money system and re replaced what with perhaps uh, this cr this crypto system. Uh, there are just so many different shifting priorities uh it's uh that's it's going to be that's right say something say something yeah, something. yeah. yeah because it, uh, for your example uh, i mean if you can take a look at the, the subway system there is no one to take the no human to take the ticket or selling the ticket for the bus the reason i think um, why people are still doing it but human i think it is just because those guys are working for the government, and uh, those guys don't know how to do the other thing. The government just don't want that much of people losing their jobs. Well, yeah, there's so the big dilemma the there. These people don't have the ability to do anything else but take tickets yes. on a bus. What kind of work are they going to do? I think the yes. three of us here, we're in positions where I think we can use our brains to make money, you know, no matter what happens. But not everybody has that ability. ability. And what do we do for those kinds of people that can't just, you know, 
do you know what I mean? Some people have to use their arms and their legs to make a living, and if automation replaces that, then what are they going to do? Right, right. That, and they, they have a larger population. Mm -hmm. It's a very significant challenge for humanity. It's the challenge of this century. This is why I think that we're moving more towards like a version of the 21st century plantation, and I think the internet is going to bring us there. I think a lot more um, unpaid job opportunities um, involving websites are going to take us there, and I think that um, that model's already being rolled out, and it's being more popular in business models as far as exploiting the more desperate people. Um, who just want to be a part of something rather than what you, 10 years ago they wouldn't even consider this kind of stuff and they would only do X amount of work for X amount of paycheck. Whereas now it's I'll do X amount of work for X amount of social value or I'll do X amount of work for X amount of recognition or I'll do X amount of work for X amount of uh, promised uh, future uh, and you, you could just you know go on and on and on from there. Well, that's why the Swiss are, are willing to at, at least uh, uh, put before their voting populace this discussion mm -hmm. of how do we, uh, what, is, what does society look like 10, 20 years from now? Do we uh, subsidize everyone with a basic income, uh, an income that provides them a living? Uh, can our economies manage that? Mm. Uh, now, of course, uh, then uh, this, in order to do it, you have to bring up the whole question of we have to completely reform the existing debt money uh, structure. Uh, nation states have to receive the seniorage hmm. from the creation of their money. You just they said right now. seniorage. They have to. Yeah, yeah go on about that, please, Destiny. Uh, uh, you know, it, this is a real problem uh, for, for governance because we just about to completely trash the existing system where all senior which goes to the commercial banking establishment and make we have to make money serve the public interest because uh, if, if it doesn't uh, society is just going to, to come unglued will rebel and they will rebel and that's what you're going to see and that's all the talk of Davos you know this increasing unrest from uh, youth unemployment. Well, it's not going to get any better. I've got news for you. Uh, we are in, in literally a, a black hole that, that, there, that there's no way up except uh, destroying the existing system where banks get the seniorage. Governments have to get the seniorage. Money has to serve the public interest or else there, it is impossible for this world to continue to function. Uh, once, once we realize that and uh, take back the money power into our individual nation states, uh, you know, then we can, and only then, can we start to deal with these uh, experimental what do we do when no one has a job, you know, when only 10% of the population is actually working? What do we do? Uh, this, there are, are, are people in Switzerland uh, on the cutting edge of this who believe that the, the government can create its own money, uh, fund this giant welfare system, mm -hmm. and somehow have it work. I'm not advocating it. I don't know. But I'm perfectly willing to see the experiment to go forward because humanity has no other choice. We've got to find another way of doing this. Very well put. And I wouldn't um, call the Swiss fools. Um, from you know my time there, I, I've learned an awful lot in Switzerland. And uh, they're not going to let a bad policy um, run for too long. So I have right. uh, complete faith in them that uh, they will be able to responsibly carry out that experiment. Right. That was an excellent question. I'm pretty much out of questions. That's all that I wanted to ask you, um, including the uh, TPP. And, you know, um, we had a partner that wanted to ask you uh, a question. It's up to you. On January 25th, uh, Manmohan Singh and Shinzo Abe signed a 
agreement uh, regarding uh, military cooperation uh, to uh, bring their ties together between uh, India and Japan in uh, the face of uh, China. Um, what plays out with that, in your opinion, and as China should, how is China going to uh, respond to that uh, cooperation between India and Japan? What, what I see more as an interlocking web of um, alliances and uh, cooperations around uh, Asia because of the situation we have between China and Japan right now. Right, and in fact, which I covered in, in my last still report, uh, which was remarkably strong, uh, that is Abe uh, um, questioned this Chinese military buildup, and in fact, said that there was absolutely no resolution to it, no pathway uh, towards de-escalating this tension without China uh, unilaterally backing down from its 10% per year rise in military spending. So that's a pretty strong statement. And, uh, and until, uh, I don't know how this is going to turn out, but uh, you can, you know, J Japan feels threatened. Uh, there are the, these islands, I forget the, the name of them, that are near Taiwan, but uh, ja Japan has uh, laid claim to them for many years. Uh, what's the name of the island again? Does anyone know? The yeah. Penang. Well, in, in any case, uh, there, there are these, these islands that uh, Japan feels that's at risk. Uh, Ch China has a lot of money to spend on an upgraded uh, military structure. Japan has, uh, since World War II, kind of been uh, uh, prevented from, from doing certain things militarily. And so it feels threatened. Uh, how this is going to play out? Yeah, well, uh, uh, naturally, uh, if Japan can, they're going to ally themselves with India. So. You know, it's a, it's a very interesting world in that regards as well. Uh, uh, nations are going to respond in their national interests. And with China obviously building a very large military presence, uh, nations like Japan and India are going to respond in. Very interesting, very interesting. That question was asked by Otto Faludi, the editor in chief of Freedom Observatory. Uh, his website is uh, www.freedomobservatory.org. Uh, that will wrap up our interview. Um, Bill, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, I really, really appreciate uh, your time with us today.